Church. This is the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. Welcome to worship. We gather for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth, our light, and our salvation. Amen. Almighty God, to whom our hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins known and unknown, things done and things we have failed to do. 
Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Beloved, God who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead to sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, your mercy delights us, and the world longs for your loving care. Hear the cries of everyone in need, and turn our hearts to love our neighbors with the love of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Good morning. Come take a seat and join me for today's children's sermon. We are in the green season, the Sundays after Epiphany, when we think about how we grow in our love and faith in Jesus. Let's listen to today's gospel story. When Jesus spoke from the mountainside, he always had important things to say. One story Jesus told as he was teaching from a mountain was about how we are like salt and light. Jesus said, you can be like salt to the rest of the world. The people were a bit confused. Us like salt, they asked.
Jesus continued, salt is important. It keeps food from going bad and makes it taste better too. Just a few specks of salt may not seem like much, but it makes a big difference to the food we eat. You may feel small, like a tiny speck of salt, but you are very important. What you do makes a difference in the world. The people began to understand. You can be like light to the rest of the world too. The people were curious to hear how Jesus would explain this. Even a small lamp can light up a big room, Jesus said. Even though you are just one person, what you do and say changes the world around you. You shouldn't hide the bright light that you are. Show the love you have for God all day, every day. Then Jesus said, God gave the Israelites special rules and leaders to help you all live God's way so that you can be like salt and light to the world. I came to help you follow the rules so that you are living in the way God wants you to live. I want you to teach others to live God's way too. This makes God happy. The people nodded, understanding what Jesus had to say and excited to make a difference in the world. So you are like that lamp shining bright in the darkness. The light of Christ is inside of you for all to see. And you are like that tiny speck of salt that brings flavor to the world. You spice things up and make things exciting. So go out, shake people up, share God's love, shine bright. Let's say a prayer, friends. Heavenly Father, gracious God, we give you thanks for the light of Christ that burns bright in us. Let us add flavor to the world and share your love and your joy wherever we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first lesson is written in the 58th chapter of Isaiah, beginning at the first verse. Shout out. Do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob, their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush, and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast I choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, 
if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted. Then your light shall rise in the darkness, and your gloom shall be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places, and make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. Word of God, Word of Life. The second lesson is written in the second chapter of First Corinthians, beginning at the first verse. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on, on the power of God. Yet among the mature we do speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to perish, but we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For what human being knows what is truly human, except the human spirit that is within so also no one comprehends what is truly God's except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed upon us by God. And we speak of these things in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. Those who are unspiritual do not receive the gifts of God's Spirit, for they are foolishness to them, and they are unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Those who are spiritual discern all things, and they are themselves subject to no one else's scrutiny. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Word of God. Word of Life.
The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer, do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And so likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, having poured on oil and wine. And then he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The Gospel of our Lord. Grace to you from peace and peace from God, our holy parent, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Our Gospel lesson for today focuses in from this 10th chapter of the Gospel of Luke on the parable of the Good Samaritan. And later in the, that same chapter, chapter 10, there's another passage that focuses, and again, it talks about being the neighbor in a different way. It talks about a closeness of relationship in a different way, relationship that we can trust, relationship that we can even understand as covenant. Covenant and intimacy of relationship and connection with God. And so for today, I want to draw our attention not away from the parable of the Good Samaritan, but focusing even more so through a lens that focuses on Mary and Martha, two sisters who encountered Jesus. And so from the Gospel of Luke, the 10th chapter, beginning with verse 38, it reads, As Jesus and his disciples went on their way as they were traveling, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed her. He welcomed him into her home. Martha had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to Jesus and she asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her saying, Martha, Martha, you're worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Mary has chosen the better part. Now, at first glance, it may seem and sound like Jesus was valuing Mary's choice over Martha's. But like most cases, we may need to just listen a little closer find out a little more and see this encounter with Jesus from up close.
for ourselves. Was Jesus really creating some kind of competition between Mary and Martha when he said, Mary has chosen the better part? Mary chose, Mary chose to sit with Jesus. Perhaps literally sitting at the Lord's feet and in doing so, made some choices, so made some other choices right along with that as well. In this historical and cultural setting where women like children were expected to be seen but not heard and stay in their appropriate place, choosing to sit with Jesus in this way meant that Mary was making some significant choices about some other things as well. In the male-dominated culture of her time, and social context. Along with the religious restrictions of her day, Mary was demonstrating a choice, a choice of behavior, a course of action that was bold on her part and even seen by many, if not most, as unacceptable behavior for a woman. She sat herself right down. An unmarried woman in a room full of men but I don't think Mary was trying to make any particular kind of social or religious or certainly not political statement. I believe that she was simply drawn to Jesus by the love of Jesus. Drawn to Jesus by the, the powerful presence of God incarnate. Drawn to Jesus, the word of God made flesh. I believe she already knew rejection. I believe that Mary already knew that look, you know, that, that look of not being appropriate, that look of not being in her right place, that look of judgment and even condemnation. I believe that Mary, that what Mary saw in Jesus was a kind of acceptance that she was not willing to turn away from, even at the cost of being socially out of order. Martha, Martha knew who Jesus was and was honored to have him in her home, her home that she shared with her sister Mary and their brother Lazarus. To have honored guests in your home in Eastern culture, even now, uh, is, is meant to, to show appropriate hospitality preparing and providing food and water and maybe wine was basic to that hospitality. And so was providing basins of water and towels and sometimes even some oil so that your guests could refresh themselves from the heat and dust of their travel. Or so that someone from the family or the household would, could wash the guest, the feet of the guest that were being welcomed into your home. I, I want you to ask, I want to ask you to, and invite you to be curious with me about this text. To care enough to wonder, care enough to bring your questions to this text with a heart and a mind and a spirit that truly desires to know. Because here we're not talking about a Samaritan, an encounter, being a good Samaritan on a dangerous stretch of road. Here we're talking about up close and personal, right in the context, perhaps even like Martha and Mary within our own homes. I wonder if Martha was worried about all of the preparations or that maybe she was trying to be protective of her sister, trying to pull Mary out of that room full of men so that she would not be scorned or ridiculed for putting herself in an inappropriate setting. And so she asked Jesus to intervene. But listen closely, she uses some particular words. She asked of Jesus, don't you care? Maybe, maybe in our imagination, when I'm wondering, maybe Martha was feeling overwhelmed. 
The narrative doesn't say specifically that Martha extended herself, extended an invitation to Jesus and his crew of at least 12 hungry men. It only says Martha welcomed them. It's possible that her brother Lazarus may have invited Jesus and those 12 guys he ran with. Or that maybe it was that Martha herself or, or maybe Martha and Mary had been out in the marketplace and had overheard or been a part of conversations with Jesus and with other disciples and knew that Jesus and his crew had no place to go, to rest and to eat. So maybe as yes, she welcomed Jesus into her home. One translation, one translation says that, that Martha had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. The phrase sitting at the feet, sitting at the feet of Jesus was also a reference of assuming the, to assuming the posture of a student in relationship to a teacher. In that tradition and cultural context, a teacher would sit down and the students would gather around the teacher, often, yes, sitting on the floor or sitting on the ground, listening and learning and, and asking questions. What if, while we're imagining, what if, what if Martha had taken her seat on the floor right alongside of Mary and the other disciples who were listening and learning from Jesus and had only gotten up to go tend to the issues of preparing food for this impromptu gathering. I mean, after all, it's not like they could phone ahead. What if Martha, what if Martha was feeling pressed and pressured by customs and traditional expectations for a woman's place in society, a woman's place in the home, these days we have a lot of press and pressure and external circumstances and voices that are rising up to pass judgment and to say where, what a woman's role and place is in society, even to the point of uh, around this issue and matter of abortion or whether or not a woman can have the right to make choices for herself when it concerns her own body. But beloved, Jesus is not the ordinary teacher and was not the ordinary teacher of that day and time, nor the ordinary teacher now of this time. Many of the disciples of Jesus in that first generation of disciples were people who no other teacher would take up time with or even consider taking on as a student, let alone as a real disciple. But Jesus, the teacher of mercy and compassion. Jesus, whose language was love and divine power, is the teacher who takes on the students, the disciples that no other teacher is willing to take a risk on. Jesus is the one no other teacher is willing to risk damaging their reputation by being seen with. In many ways, it's not just the matter of Martha welcoming Jesus into her home. By the time Martha asked her question, Jesus, don't you care? Jesus had already welcomed Martha and Mary and Lazarus and all the other disciples into his embrace, into a covenant relationship with God Almighty. Martha asked Jesus, do you care? Perhaps she's beginning to feel that old, familiar feeling of being relegated to the kitchen, out of sight and out of mind. Jesus, do you care? Or are you just like every other man in this male-dominated societal structure? Jesus, do you care or was I wrong about you? There is a quote that says, the opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. The opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. Indifference 
an absence of caring one way or another about a matter or about people. Indifference, you know, that feeling like it makes no difference to me. An absence of concern or caring. caring. The theologian and writer Walter Brueggemann writes about covenant as a subversive paradigm, a subversive model, if you will, that significantly changes old ways and old notions about what it means to be in relationship. At one point, Brueggemann talks about covenant as that quality of relationship that draws us away from indifference and into caring. The kind of experience of covenant that shapes community in new ways and creates of us communities where we, where instead of not caring about anything except our own well-being and turns us instead toward being real community. Away from just caring about ourselves to caring about our neighbor. Bruin calls it a turning, turning from selfish triviality to solidarity. Have you noticed, beloved, that we're in a time and in a, in a historical context where it seems that, that over the most trivial of things, certain individuals are deciding that it's okay for them to take a gun and kill 15, 20 people or even more over circumstances and situations that that are not up to just one individual, certain individual to decide. We find ourselves uh, experiencing in these times war of one nation against another. Jesus, don't you care? Jesus, don't you care? Jesus, don't you care? Jesus responds to Martha. And I believe is responding to us, recognizing, yes, you are concerned and worried about a lot of things. But what Mary has chosen doesn't have to be taken away from her in order for you to benefit. Beloved, in the economy of God, we are not seduced and then trapped into some kind of a zero-sum game where in order for you to win, I have to lose. Where in order for me to flourish, you have to be diminished. Our God is the God of abundance. And there is no scarcity in God. And isn't it scarcity? Isn't it scarcity that is frightening some segments of our society and some, some who have tremendous uh, influence and even uh, power and authority as elected officials, but still within themselves carry a level of fear that, uh, that there's not going to be enough and so someone has to lose. Our God is the God of abundance. And again, I say to you, beloved, there is no scarcity in God. We don't have to be afraid to love. We don't have to be afraid to give. We don't have to be afraid to trust the fullness of God. In fact, by the grace of God and the will of God, we carry within ourselves the spirit of God that is that fullness that equips and prepares us for living in a manner and in a way that is not afraid. Martha, Martha, you don't have to be afraid or feel small. There is more than enough room for you. Sitting with Jesus, beloved, feeds our souls. Sitting with Jesus nourishes our spirits. Sitting with Jesus tends to our deep need for being valued and being loved and being recognized. Jesus wasn't passing judgment on Martha's way of serving as somehow being less or unimportant but simply letting her know 
and letting us know that he has come that we may have life and have life abundantly. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again and ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, 
and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Here at Mount Olive, uh, here at Santa Monica, next Sunday, July 17th, right after our nine o'clock service, uh, we'll take our time, take a little bit of a break for some refreshments, and then we'll gather for, have opportunity to gather for about 45 minutes, maybe to an hour, to talk about and discuss, and maybe do some, some fresh learning about what evangelism really is, what it is and what it isn't. What, and why we as disciples of Jesus do or get engaged and involved, invest ourselves in this work, in this ministry of evangelism, telling others the good news of Jesus Christ. Come and join us. If you have a need for, uh, for child care, if that becomes uh, an issue or a concern for you, please call the church office and let us know what your need might be, and we'll work to help try to make that happen. But come and join us next Sunday. For our prayers of intercession, after each prayer I will say, Merciful God, and then we will all say together, Receive our prayer. Call together to follow Jesus. We pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Call your people to seek your wisdom in difficult conversations and action. Give the church everywhere courage to repent for the ways we have tolerated and practiced injustice. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Inspire our wonder at creation, from the light of dawn to the beauty of the dark night. Sustain the unseen depths of the ocean to the plants and animals we know well. Bring healing to lands and communities experiencing natural disasters. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Instruct the powerful in your ways, Provide upright leadership in business and industry that workers are not oppressed. Throughout the world, inspire voters and raise up politicians to heed your call for nations to practice righteousness. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Loosen the bonds of injustice in our midst. Grant peace to endless quarrels. Put an end to hunger and break every yoke of oppression. Shelter all who flee abuse in their homes or violence in their communities. Satisfy those afflicted in any way, especially those we name silently or aloud. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Shape our congregation to be salt for the earth. Give us delight in your commandments that we are generous with those in need. Make us steadfast in our trust in you ready with tangible mercy and compassion for our neighbors. We especially pray for the ministries of administration, leadership, and finances in this interim season, for the preschool ministry, and for the ministries of being caring partners with those who are sick, those who are experiencing food insecurity, and those who are houseless. Merciful God, receive our prayer. The cross and resurrection bring redemption from sin and death. We praise you for all those unshaken faith in Christ shines forth in their witness. Keep them in our remembrance and bring us with them into the kingdom of heaven. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We bring to you our needs and hopes, O God, trusting your wisdom and power revealed in Christ crucified. Amen. Peace of Christ be with you always. We offer thanksgiving for the word. Let us pray. Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you made all things. You spoke light into darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought forth into being life. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. By your word, you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, 
water on the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life with you. For your word of life, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness, to witness forgiveness through the cross, to witness life to those entombed by death, to witness the way of your self-giving love. For your word of life, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise. Send forth your spirit of truth, O oh God, Rekindle your gifts within us, renew our faith, increase our hope, and deepen our love for the sake of a world in need. Faithful to your word, O oh God, draw near to all who call on you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, serve the poor.